Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. A few days back, Alexander Parkamov sent me uh, an email saying that his paper, uh, referring to his 225-day uh, reactor that produced uh, 2.1 MeV per nickel atom, uh, has finally been published after six months sitting on the editor's desk uh, at Unconventional Science uh, PDF 23 Parkamov 2.pdf. And uh, so this is about this reactor that I uh, reported uh, on the sidelines of ICCF 21. And uh, he's gone into quite some uh, detail, uh, but it is succinct. And so I have taken the liberty of translating this. And uh, I, there are some really interesting points that I want to bring out uh, from uh, the translation, which I think people may be uh, interested in looking at. So that's actually the Russian. Uh, so here we go. It's a nickel uh, hydrogen heat generator continuously working for seven months. Uh, sorry, uh, when I'm doing the translation, some of the characters are misplaced. Um, so anyway, uh, the abstract is uh, a nickel hydrogen heat generator was created that continuously worked for 225 days uh, with a heat dissipation power exceeding the consumed electricity from 200 to 1000 watts with the thermal coefficient uh, of power, basically a COP, uh, more out than in, uh, in on the thermal basis over the electricity basis of 1.6 to 3.6. Completion of the work is connected with the exhaustion of the fuel energy. That's a bad translation, but basically um, there was no more excess heat coming out. It was a, a one output on the thermal determination and the one uh, compared to the input electricity. And so therefore it was concluded, uh, the experiment, because uh, it would seem that the fuel had um, actually expired. Uh, total excess energy generation of about uh, 4.1 gigajoules, so 4,100 uh, megajoules. Um, the fuel used in the heat uh, generator is hydrogen saturated nickel powder weighing 1.2 grams. Energy released per one nickel atom, 2.1 MeV. Uh, changes in the elemental and isotopic composition of fuel and structural materials are analyzed. Now, uh, you can read this in your own time. There's just a couple of key points and a couple of interesting tidbits that I want to pull out of here. And so I will, and uh, I'm going to zoom in a little so we can get a little bit extra clarity. Now, the first one uh, is something I, I really want everyone to pay a lot of attention to. Um, it, this is the preliminary operations. At the preparatory stage, in order to remove water residues and other volatile contaminants from the reactor, a vacuum pump was used to pump out the air at a temperature of up to uh, 300 degrees C. After that, after that, the heat generator was filled with hydrogen at a pressure close to atmospheric and kept at a temperature of about 350 degrees C for three hours to clean the surface of the nickel granules. After this, a secondary pumping out of the gas was done to remove the water resulting from the reduction of the nickel oxide with hydrogen. So the oxygen on, uh, in the nickel oxide on the surface of the nickel uh, this kind of uh, carbonyl nickel with these very dendritic sort of uh, spiky surface that we analysed uh, a number of times uh, uh, a few years ago and shared the uh, uh, SEMs and EDX of that. It is pure nickel, uh, apart from the oxide on the surface. The hydrogen from the hydrogen uh, gas coming in at 350 degrees uh, takes the uh, uh, oxygen off that nickel surface and makes it into water and then you repump it out. Uh, and then he says, then the reactor was refilled with hydrogen and kept for three days at a temperature of 350 degrees C. Then, after repeating the pumping cycle twice more, it was filled with hydrogen and the heat generator was moved from the preliminary preparation stand to the main workstation. A view of the working uh, heat generator measuring uh, and power equipment is shown in figure three. Now, I cannot emphasize this enough. When we visited um, P in 2015, in January 2015, as part of uh, uh, Project Fedora, we uh, were told by him over and over and over again that basically you will not see any excess heat in the nickel hydrogen system unless your nickel surface is absolutely free, particularly of oxygen. He said if you have oxygen, 
you ain't going to see any excess heat. Uh, and so this is essentially uh, what we're seeing here. Now, he also told us, um, uh, Piantelli, that, uh, you know, this is not new information. And uh, following that, I uh, did some research and I produced a presentation, uh, which I'm going to look at now. So the presentation I'm referring to is the New Fires 100 plus year uh, gestation and uh, it was published on the 22nd of July 2016 and it particularly refers to uh, the work of one Thomas F. Uh, Thomas Graham FRS uh, who lived from 1805 to 1869 that's the chappie uh, this is the PDF that was uh, talked about in the presentation and I will give a link to this presentation and this PDF because I think it's very, very relevant. I was going to put this in a separate presentation um, with regard to how I uh, understand that the Mizuno reactor may be working. But with early uh, an attempt uh, not looking so good uh, initially, uh, I really wanted to uh, come back to this data that uh, whilst uh, Piantelli didn't uh, actually spell it out for us, he did say that, you know, this stuff is over 100 years old, uh, m most of the important bits that you need to know. Uh, and uh, so in digging around, I found this uh, way back in 2015-16, uh, and I produced this presentation. And essentially, Thomas Graham... <laughs> learned about how uh, hydrogen there was no understanding what deuterium was back then because then learned about you know um uh, the uh, heavier isotope uh, back then but he really defined what was necessary to get uh, uh, hydrogenated uh, palladium and uh, and and uh, the best ways for to get the maximum uh, absorption and adsorption by metals and he, he he often did palladium and platinum but anyway this paper that he published in 1868 so that was just the year before he died it's absolutely seminal and anyone serious about Leonard has to go and uh, look at this and look at what's come from this and uh, what, what I want you to draw you to your attention to is this slide where in 1868 Thomas, FR, uh, Thomas Graham FRS he established that you need absolute purity of the metallic surface being essential to the first absorbing action. So you literally must strip it off. And in the case of palladium, uh, you have to have first the, uh, the, the material cleaned. And this is what Parkamov is talking about by doing these, uh, firstly baking out at a lower temperature to get rid of nitrogen and other uh, uh, volatiles that might be on there. You don't want to set those permanently in place uh, and, and cause a problem uh, before you start uh, trying to get rid of the oxides and putting hydrogen in. And once you've got rid of those in deep vacuum, then you're loading with um, uh, your, uh, not loading, but putting hydrogen in to reduce the oxygen, take it out as water and do repeat that a number of cycles. And I think in, in Piantelli's case, he, he would do this for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And certainly in Parkamov's case, you're looking at a, a, at least a couple of weeks of prep, preparation. So these kind of experiments to get them done right, to prepare the materials, is just not a simple thing that you can get going very quickly. And so here it's saying, establish that the cooled metals held onto their occluded hydrogen, even in a vacuum, and that you needed to heat the occluding material to release the gas, in this case, of, in the case of palladium, 100 degrees C. And you think he found in the case of um, uh, platinum, uh, you needed to be at red heat, which is, uh, you know, at least 400 degrees C. So um, really everything you need to know is here, right in this paper, about how you should uh, uh, try and get uh, the first uh, absorbing action optimal for um, uh producing Lena. Of course, he wasn't produ trying to produce Lena back here, but what he want did do is, uh, if you look down here, is uh, palladium nanocluster platelets, which he created by uh, putting deposition onto platinum, and it produced these little platelets that came off. It says, when heated to 100 degrees C in hydrogen occluded 982.14 volumes of gas, essentially he was getting a PD to H ratio of 1 to 1. And, and this is basically as, as high as anyone has ever been able to achieve um, with respect to uh, Lenner experiments. So all the way back in uh, prior to uh, 1868, uh, this uh, information was known. And uh, this is 
no more uh, relevant, uh, no less relevant today. Uh, and uh, you can see here that he's basically doing the same thing, uh, Alexander Parkamov, and the same kind of process will be uh, necessary if you have any chance of achieving um, the um, uh, excess heat in uh, the work of Mizuno. So anyone out there replicating, uh, these are things that uh, uh, scientists are repeatedly rediscovering, um, but uh, Thomas Graham uh, had done it in the 1860s. Uh, so what I would suggest uh, people do is look at the uh, a process that uh, Alexander Parkamov has deployed here uh, in his experiment uh, with apparent very extreme excess, uh, sorry, success rather, of excess, um, and uh, maybe compare this to what's going on in Mizuno's work and consider where the sim similarities lie. Now, that for me is the really important thing that I wanted to draw people's attention to because the, the key data about the 2.1 MeV, like I said, this, this was shared at ICCF 21 uh, um, uh, previously. So here's the reactor and uh, it's quite nice because he has the core reactor with the fuel in it and it's separated with the uh, tungsten heater wire and then this is in a hydrogen environment. So all of this has got a hydrogen environment and the center has got a hydrogen environment. This is kind of breathable, these bungs are breathable. Uh, and there's the, the beauty of having this hydrogen environment here is that the tungsten heater wire, which is the only thing you can uh, respectfully or easily get up to the very high temperatures that he was trying to achieve at 2000 Kelvin plus or be capable of withstanding that, um, uh, it's, if you had it in any form of uh, oxygen, uh, it would uh, fall apart really, really, really quickly. So being in the hydrogen environment is, is useful for that. And then uh, by having this long tube here with these bungs, the, the uh, uh, thermal conductivity is very weak. And so he could use these uh, silicon infills uh, uh, and they wouldn't uh, degrade because of the temperature. And so he could use those for putting pass-throughs and also, if necessary, uh, doing pressure measurements or injecting new gas at a later time. So anyway, that is the schematic. This is the schematic of the control equipment. That's uh, the overview of the thing. But uh, in the experiment, he uh, achieved a COP, uh, apparently, of 3.6. Um, and... Uh, uh, he goes into various parts of the uh, uh, overall experiment where different actions were uh, taken on various days and what happened to the COP following that uh, with some close-up areas uh, uh, highlighted there. And then here, here's the overall uh, data sets. Uh, so you've got the pressure here going down. The pressure is basically flat lines. They increase a bit of pressure, get a little bit more of a COP, but then it kind of comes after... a a period of time then starts to drop uh, precipitously down. They try and rescue the reactor by putting uh, more uh, pressure of hydrogen in. It blips up and then just goes down to dead. And they, they tried it, putting uh, some extra power in at this time, but it, you know, it flatlined and this is a COP of one. And so this was, uh, they concluded that that was the end of the cycle. Now the interesting, they did post calibration with the reactor um, above uh, the 1000 degrees centigrade where he considers you know you're going to start to get any, any excess heat after the uh, experiment was shown to a flatlined and uh, both b below 1000 and above after the supposed reactor was not able to produce any more excess heat the the calibration of the below 1000 degree closely matched the uh, null reactor beforehand but anyway you can re read it all in here but there are a couple of other things that are really really interesting I think uh, here the analysis of isotopic and element changes in fuel and structural materials. Now, um, I just want to read this and then I want people to think of the implications. The accumulation of excess energy for more than seven months of uh, operation of the heat generator, uh, 4,100 megajoules, is comparable to the time spent on the Rossi heat generator in Lugano, which was supposedly 5,800 megajoules. The fuel analysis, and bear in mind, this reactor had lithium in it. And, uh, you know, uh, Alexander Parkamore's reactor didn't have lithium in it. So uh, do bear that in mind. But he says, we could expect strong isotopic changes in the fuel of our heat generator. But the analysis made at Synthestech Scientific Research Centre and Uppsala University in Sweden, where the fuel of the Rossi heat generator was analysed, 
did not reveal significant isotopic anomalies in the in nickel spent in our heat generator. Okay, so that's all in the the paper there. So the the this is quite interesting because he's saying essentially, you know, without the lithium involved, there didn't appear to be any um, changes in the isotopes uh, in uh, his reactor, which produced a similar amount of power. Uh, granted, uh, the uh, Lugana reactor was operating for, uh, I think it was 32 days, and uh, the reactor of Alexander Parkamov was uh, operating for 225 days. So it didn't produce quite as much, and it did it in a much longer period of time uh, than the Lugana reactor. So you do have to bear those things in mind. So is lithium playing a huge role in the uh, isotopic shifts in nickel observed in that experiment, or rather that were uh, supposedly analyzed to have been observed? Um, I did show a potential way that that might have occurred. Uh, and uh, so in the absence of lithium, maybe this is the result you get. And, and nickel is just providing uh, a means by which you can produce uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, monoatomic uh, hydrogen or different uh, uh, states of hydrogen or hydrogen clusters. And it is really just being a catalyst. And uh, the lithium is is maybe doing a lot of the more of the heat generation in this shorter time frame. But anyway, um, those are speculations, but this is the data that has been observed. Here's the reactor. Um, this is the synthesis data. This is the Uppsala data and so forth. And this is reference. And you can look at this in your own time. Now, the other thing that's uh, interesting down here is that note that no significant changes were found not only in the, uh, in the described, but also in none of the nickel hydrogen reactors where such analysis were made. So uh, the reactor in Lugano 7 and 8 is an exception. So he's basically saying that the Lugano reactor is the only experiment where there were isotopic shifts uh, observed uh, in uh, the nickel. So... Um, is the lithium playing a very specific role in that? Don't know. Uh, anyway, he goes on to say that an analysis of elemental composition of the substance of samples taken in different places of the heat generator was made at Synthes Tech Research Center and at Ameritech, uh, uh, sorry, Amtertech LLC by energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. Note that this method analyzes the surface layer of the substance and does not allow the determination of the elements lighter than aluminium. Many elements were found, including those that were initially absent in the fuel and structural materials. Vanadium, gallium, cobalt, strontium. <laughs> There's an element I don't know or found. Anyway, go and have a look at that. <laughs> Hafnium. I, I suspect it's a... a oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, maybe that's a mistranslation. I don't know. Uh, VB. Um, uh, that's caught me off guard. Um, especially a lot of calcium appeared uh, in the inner ceramic tube. The calcium content reached 23%, which is an initial content with an initial content of about 1%. Some of the results are shown in figure 9 and 10. And so uh, he's showing that on the inside here, the calcium uh, went hugely up. And what we have observed uh, in a number of experiments, and quite a few people have observed the production of calcium. I talked about this in one of my... Uh, recent presentations that calcium is uh, deck alpha and Lena seems to want to produce uh, alpha uh, uh, groupings or in the synthesized elements so this is observed uh, by uh, uh, Adamenko it was observed by Leclerc uh, it's been observed by us where uh, we had this slug material uh, in uh, the uh, Lion reactor, which contained uh, carbon, which is tri-alpha, oxygen, which is quad-alpha, and calcium, which is dec-alpha. So is it maybe that the hydrogen is being, you know, fused in some way and, and ends up assembling um, the double magic calcium and uh, that's really a good end stop for it all the time there are light elements to work with of course the method does not be uh, is not able to see anything lighter than uh, aluminium anyway um, so you know uh, this is another interesting data point and uh, it's another replication potentially of calcium uh, 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 production one could imagine 
maybe there's why would the calcium come as which is only one percent and suddenly end up as 23 percent uh on the surface here who can say um although i think it's saying that the it's 23 percent on this surface because that's what it, it's viewed as so if that's a cracked plane and we've got 23 percent in there what is it doing is it reorganizing all those nucleons don't know um something to consider so that's it um uh, thank you very, very much for your time. I think the big takeaways from this are the big production of calcium. Obviously, the the, the, the fact that there was a lot of uh, energy generated, uh, that it's comparable to Lugano, but it ran for maybe six times as long or something like that. Um, or seven times as long, uh, approximately. Six, six to seven times as long. Um, uh, but that without lithium, there was no uh, isotopic shifts uh, that were determinable in uh, the nickel. Uh, and uh, then um, uh, the thing that you should really, really hold in mind if you're doing any form of nickel hydrogen experiment, uh, and as I've said before, with palladium as well, you need to consider absolutely cleaning out that material uh, as was defined uh, by Thomas uh, Graham uh, uh, in uh, 1868. You um, cannot get the proper absorption uh, of uh, uh, the hydrogen isotope without a full purity of the metallic surface. It is essential. So thank you very much for your time. I'll see you in the next video.